lower social class, obesity, sleep problems, child, um, childhood trauma, all these things are associated with uh, abnormalities in uh, neuroinflammatory neuro markers uh, and therefore likely to be associated with depression and no one has demonstrated that there's any specific uh, association with depression. It's just another example of how, um, of how markers of, um, of things that may well be socially determined get, get translated into individualising language. As far as treatment is concerned, treatment has made this, um, the way that we understand treatment assumes that, generally, that it's targeting an underlying abnormality or disease. Uh, so, of course, we've been inundated with this idea that antidepressants um, rectify biochemical imbalances um, in serotonin or other, other neurotransmitters, as in these advertisements, uh, and it's all over professional literature as well. Uh, and you're well aware that that's been associated with a huge increase in antidepressant prescribing. But there are, but there are ways that antidepressants might work, for uh, inverted commas, or um, might appear to be different from a placebo that are not dependent on them targeting an underlying disease or abnormality. Um, and a lot of my work has been trying to think about other ways that, that drugs might be working when they give, we give them to people with mental health problems. And I've proposed that um, in contrast to this idea that the drugs that we give um, correct an underlying abnormality, they might in fact be inducing an abnormality or an alteration in mental functioning. All the drugs that we use for mental health problems are what we might call psychoactive drugs. They're drugs that change brain, brain functioning. Um, so if you give them to animals or people who don't have a diagnosis, there will be some change in the way that they um, behave and, and, and their, their emotions and their um, perceptions. Um, and what I've been saying is that these changes um, May, uh, are going to affect the way that uh, mental health problems manifest themselves in ways that might be useful or might appear to be useful. So if you think of the use of um, uh, antipsychotics or major tranquilizers, as they used to be called for people with psychosis, this is the idea that what these drugs are doing is slowing people down, reducing people's emotional arousal and emotional investment in their... In their um, experiences and therefore making them calmer and sometimes better able to function. So these drugs are not rectifying an underlying abnormality but producing alterations that may be helpful. Um, of course we shouldn't forget that there are placebo effects which affect the result of trials and uh, any drug that has noticeable effects will have amplified placebo effects. So, in fact, if we look at drugs like antidepressants, the difference between an antidepressant and a placebo is very small. It's only a couple of points on a scale, a Hamilton scale is 54 points. Um, and, and it's a couple of points which, which may well be explained by amplified placebo effects. In order to use... Um, drugs for mental health problems intelligently, therefore, and to understand what they might be doing, we really need to know what sort of alterations they produce. And there's been very little work on this, which is just a demonstration of how all our thinking has been within that model of seeing drugs as disease-targeting treatments. We've not been interested in the sort of alterations that they might be producing. Um, but actually, there's a little bit of... Um, of research that we can use to find, to find out about these alterations and we can also ask people who've taken the this sort of medication. We know that tricyclic antidepressants, for example, are profoundly sedating substances which um, slow, cause slowing on the EEG and, and you know, slowing up of cognitive responses and reaction times um, and, uh, and may therefore be useful if people um, are experiencing severe insomnia or anxiety. Um, SSRIs appear to uh, be much less strong in the alterations they, they produce. Uh, and while on the one hand they do induce some lethargy, some um, reduced activity, fogginess, loss of libido, that's, that's well, um, well documented, their sexual... Uh, sexual effects. 
Um, they also, in some people, seem to cause tension and anxiety and agitation. Um, they seem to... Uh, most, most people describe, many people describe that they cause a feeling of emotional numbing or disengagement, which may well reduce feelings of uh, depression, but also people say reduce feelings of happiness and positive emotions as well. So, so, so the question that I think we should be asking ourselves when we think about drug treatment is, you know, what sort of alterations do drugs produce? What sort of effects are they going to have on someone who is depressed or anxious or, or in distress of some sort? Um, and, and will those, you know, might those effects be useful? Um, but even if they're useful long term, what, short term, what sort of long term do they, effects do they have? What's the balance of pros and cons? That's, that those are all the things that I think we should be thinking about. Um, to question the idea that something like depression is a disease is not just a sort of radical out there view of people like Thomas Saz, Adolf Mayer, who was the most eminent psychiatrist of the mid 20th century, um, said this about the disease model. He said that, you know, if you accept the disease model, you've just surrendered your common sense. Um, and, and he said that we should be trying to view abnormal mental trends, as he referred to them, as genuine but faulty attempts to meet situations, attempts that are worthy of being analysed, worthy of being understood, that they are meaningful. So he's saying that, you know, when people get into certain sorts of, of conditions that we might call a mental disorder, they're trying to deal with the situation, but sometimes in a way that's actually making it worse or, or getting them into further problems. The social constructivist point of view on emotions, I think, is, is really useful as well. Again, they emphasise that emotions are complex human responses to the environment, and they're not simply the same as physiological reactions. And there is, of course, there are going to be biochemical changes, biological things going on in our bodies when we experience emotions, but we've got no evidence that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between this change and that emotion. In fact, we've got evidence that it's not like that. The fight-or-flight response that's characterised by this a surge of adrenaline and noradrenaline and arousal hormones can be associated with different sorts of emotions, with anger, with anxiety, with elation, with all sorts of, of different emotional states. And emotions, it also emphasises that emotions, emotions are moral evaluations. They're evaluations of a state as something you like or don't like, that you feel is good or bad. Um, they're not just uh, completely objective situations. Um, so just, I'm just trying to emphasise really that the concept of diagnosis, when it's used to... Uh, convey the idea that there's an underlying disease or biological abnormality is not based in evidence and I think is potentially harmful because it's, it's disempowering for people. It leads to the mass use of, of drugs like antidepressants that have harmful effects that are listed in side effects, but, we, but may also pharmacologically make people more passive and less engaged with what the problem in their environment is and what they might be able to do to address it. Okay, I'll finish there. Thank you.